Hello, Yann Lekin. Thank you for being with us this morning. You are one of the key men in the invention of artificial intelligence in the world. You are French, but you have been living in the United States for 30 years. You have taught at the New York University and the Collège de France. You are the head of artificial intelligence at Meta, parent company of Facebook, where you run the artificial intelligence research laboratory. This is for them. I add that you also won prestigious Turing Award in 2018, considered the Nobel Prize in Computer Science. So we are very happy to have you on enter this morning for this special day. First of all, tell us how the young student, the young sir, at the University of Pierre et Marie Curie that you were in the ITs, was attracted by the power of machines, by their intelligence, by the thrills of what artificial intelligence will be. For me, the mystery of intelligence is one of the great scientific questions of the moment. And then I had a little bit of the fiber of the engineer. So the logic is actually to try to build machines that are intelligent, to try to understand intelligence in general, human intelligence, animal intelligence, and maybe make intelligent machines. Maybe, in any case, what you have done more and more, since we could say that your career is confused with the evolution of artificial intelligence, you had started by inventing a machine capable of scanning checks in the 1990s. After failures, you say, I had several failures, and then you brought up deep learning at the beginning of the 20 teens, which will revolutionize the world of tech and blow up artificial intelligence can you explain to us, for those who are in doubt, what are the beneficial effects of artificial intelligence today in many areas, and especially in medicine and, for example, for road safety? How do autonomous vehicle systems or diagnostics carried out on IRMS already save lives? Yes, so all the cars that come out in Europe today. Thanks to a European law, must have an automatic collision detection system. It's called the EBS, Automatic Emergency Braking System in English. So these are the systems that allow the car to brake automatically if a pedestrian crosses in front of you and you haven't had time to react. It saves lives, it reduces collisions by about 40 p or so. So that's a very concrete application. But there are applications of the same kind of technology, that is, what we call computer vision, recognition of forms, which are largely based on one of my inventions at the end of the 80s and the beginning of the 90s, which is called convoluted networks. And we see that on our cell phones, systems that identify, I don't know, a kind of plant from a photo of the leaf, things like like that. So everything that concerns image recognition has made huge progress over the past 10 years, although the basic techniques go back to the end of the 80s and the beginning of the 90s. It is only recently that we have had enough data to train them and a fairly powerful computer to run them. And on health medicine, on health, there are a lot of applications currently being tested and partially deployed because, of course, it takes time before putting on the market systems that have to do with health. But identification systems, detection systems, for example, of tumors in mammographies, systems that accelerate data collection when you pass an IRM, that is, instead of being lying in a noisy machine for 40 minutes, we can reduce that to a dozen minutes with a system that actually produces an image of the same quality as if we had spent the 40 minutes thanks to the progress of deep learning. It is now carried out by all the major manufacturers. In fact, these are technologies that have been developed in collaboration by FAIR, which is the research laboratory in an eye of meat and by New York University, so the university where I teach. But hey, it's a huge subject at the moment, medical imaging assisted by a computer. And then on top of that, a lot of promises. For the moment, there are promises, but a lot of promises in the field of the discovery of new drugs. Thanks to the use of artificial intelligence to, for example, predict the formation of proteins and know how to do the, the conception of a molecule that will stick to a particular place on a protein and have a biological effect. You say that artificial intelligence will really enter our daily lives in a more or less distant future in the form of virtual assistants who will first be in our smartphones and who may one day be in other objects of everyday life, such as glasses, for example. 
tablette, par exemple, How will this virtual world, which will be superimposed on the real world, be a progress in your eyes? For many people, it may seem terrifying. We can say that the virtual world will replace the real world and that the machine will want to dominate the human. What do you answer to that? So the first thing is maybe we can ask ourselves the question, will there ever be machines that are as intelligent as humans in all areas where humans are intelligent? And the answer to that is absolutely yes. There is no doubt about that. Is that already the case? No, it's not the case. We are still quite far away. Despite the recent progress and the dialogue systems like Chet GPT and so on which have become available to the public, we have the impression that these systems are intelligent. But in fact, they don't have the type of intelligence that we see in humans. So they are very capable of manipulating the language, and that gives us the impression that they are intelligent. But in fact, it's a very superficial intelligence, I would say. But you say that in the end, the machine will be superior to human intelligence. Yes, that makes no doubt. So now the question is what will be the consequences of that on society, and so on. Is it potentially beneficial? Uh, uh, the answer is yes. Is it potentially dangerous? Probably. So will they be afraid? No. In the sense that artificial intelligence is a way to amplify human intelligence, just as machines are a way to amplify physical strength, if you will. And you shouldn't be afraid of artificial intelligence. On the contrary, you have to see it as a certain new rebirth, perhaps a new start, possibly for humanity, because the progress of humanity is limited by human intelligence. You say that, and yet it still scares artificial intelligence today, especially when we learn, for example, that the Goldman Sachs Bank announces that artificial intelligence could threaten up to 300 million jobs in the world. What do you say? Should we keep our word or not? Yes, it's true. One day, robots will replace humans and will work in our place. One day, perhaps, my virtual assistant will ask you the questions and your virtual assistant will answer me in this interview. This story that technology moves jobs. It's true. Since the beginning of technological development, for millennia, and in theory since the Industrial Revolution at the end of the 19th century, for example, at the end of the 19th century, most of the French population worked in food production worked in fields, in farms, and so on. Now, it's between 1 and 12 percent of the population. So there is a shift in jobs due to technological progress. We can try to look 20 years back for those of us who are quite old and ask ourselves the question, what did you want to say at that time to be a YouTuber or to be an influencer on Instagram? These are jobs that did not exist. Technology creates new jobs and removes others, of course. But 300 million jobs were moved in the world in the long run. That's huge, isn't it? So the question is how long? Is the transition going to happen extremely quickly? Or is it going to happen at a rate that will allow people to reform themselves, to retraining to new technologies? We also saw this with the advent of the Internet, with the advent of computers, and so on. A whole bunch of jobs from the 60s and 70s that no longer exist because of the progress of technology. So it's not a new phenomenon. The eye is not qualitatively different from other technological transformations. And what economists tell us is that the speed with which a technology enters society and the economy in particular. La rapidité avec laquelle une technologie entre et pénètre la société. Uh, and economy in particular, is limited by the ability of people to learn to use it. It was true for the computer. And in general, it takes 10 or 20 years, rather 20 years. The most important thing is to know if you are young, what kind of studies to do. If you are younger, do you have to reform yourself and use new technologies? For the question you asked about young people, what studies to do? What is your answer when you are asked the question? Well, several things. Knowledge in terms of scientific or technical professions will not disappear, even if we have machines that can help us write programs faster, for example, which already exist, or help with design. What these machines will allow is for a wider category of people to be creative at the artistic or technical level. Au niveau artistique ou technique. 
and so there will be a kind of democratization of creation. But the professions of creation, whether artistic, literary, scientific or technical, will not disappear. Simply, more people will be able to create musical and so on. Jan Lekin, there is another criticism that often comes back. It is the fear that artificial intelligence is becoming an anti-democracy tool. We have seen it with these last days, with these images, these videos, these texts, which seem true while they are false information, disinformation, manipulations, the false images of the Pope in white clothes, of Charles E. and Camilla in beavers, or of Donald Trump arrested. It looked real. It was not real. It was artificial intelligence. How do we fight against that? Should there be an ethical artificial intelligence? Should we think about an ethical artificial intelligence? There are other things, of course. There are ethical problems at the level of society, regulation problems, and so on. And then, moreover, also the need to have new technologies that allow to trace the origin of content. That is to say, the Pope dressed in a dao dao. Well, it was a little bit obvious that it was wrong. It does not bring much consequences. But it would have been nice to know that it was actually produced by a system that said this kind of image could have been produced a decade ago with image creation tools like Photoshop and others. So it's not new. Simply, what people are thinking about a little bit is that now, these systems are so simple to use that they would allow to produce a huge amount of information that would of course be false. And so having systems that allow to trace the origin of pieces of information would be very useful. Well, by the way, people are not stupid. And the young people who grow up with the Internet know, for example, to take with a big handful of salt everything that comes out of the Internet and try to trace the origin of it. So not everyone has time to do that, and not everyone has the spirit to do it. But I think that, in the end, the presence of many pieces of false information will make people more and more skeptical and more and more able to trace the origin of information. Information. That would be the right scenario. The other scenario would be that we are drowned under false information and that we no longer know at all what is true and what is false. Yes, but you know, it's a little bit like spam in the mail. We probably receive a lot more spam than real mail, but the mail systems filter automatically. So on Facebook, for example, there is a big team working on eliminating false accounts, on dangerous disinformation, and so on. And in fact, artificial intelligence is not the problem there. Artificial intelligence is actually the solution. That is to say that, for example, you want to detect if something, a piece of information is false. Detect if it comes from a source that is not reliable. So, for example, a warehouse run by the Kremlin to try to influence the elections in Europe and the United States. Artificial intelligence is actually used as a countermeasure. Comme, uh, contre de ces, uh, as a filter, filter as a filter of false information. For the moment, we haven't seen it on social networks, Facebook, Facebook and, and elsewhere. Les, les the interference, for example, of the Russians in the elections in the United States or in Europe, they have not been filtered. Yes, of course, they have been filtered. So there was indeed an interference in 2016 for the United States presidential election. Facebook, at the time it was called Meet, was aware of it after the coup, unfortunately, and immediately put in place measures so that the story does not repeat itself for the 2017 presidential election in France and the German general elections in 2017. And there was no problem thanks to these measures that were taken. So every time there is a problem like that that arises, there is a countermeasure that is put in place to correct it. What people do not realize, for example, is that one of the largest applications of artificial intelligence at the moment at the scale level, if you will, size, is the moderation of content in social networks, whether Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Twitter, and so on. In fact, artificial intelligence techniques are quite sophisticated, even very sophisticated, to remove hate speech, for example. Illegal content such as terrorist propaganda, exploitation of children, pedophilia, and so on. So all this content, people are trying to disseminate it, and they are. 
Et ils sont euh, blocked by artificial intelligence. It is probably the largest deployment of artificial intelligence to date. But it's a little behind the curtain. People don't see it. Yes, people don't see it because for the moment we see a lot of hateful content and sometimes a terrorist character. We continue to see them on social networks. There are very few, in fact, the percentage of hateful content, for example, on Facebook is around 0.2% in recent estimates. So it's very small. Yes, not Twitter. Twitter is another story. They handle it in a completely different way. But I can say on Facebook anyway. And then the rate of hateful content that is automatically deleted, that is, before anyone sees is it compared to the totality of hateful content that is posted on Facebook. More than 90 percent are actually automatically deleted by iSystems before anyone sees them. And those who go through the net are, of course, labeled by users and then examined manually. And this in several hundred languages. So it's a very difficult problem, and which has made huge progress in recent years thanks to the progress of research in AI. That is to say that the same figure four or five years ago was rather around 30 percent. That is to say that a large part of the hateful content went through the net because it's very difficult to detect sometimes. But thanks to the progress of AI in recent years, by the way, using very similar techniques to what is now used in the dialogue systems such as ChatGPT. It has made monstrous progress. So we come back to the program that everyone is talking about today. ChatGPT, this software launched last November that can answer all questions, that can write texts or emails to demand and even pass exams in our place. Bill Gates talked about the greatest technological revolution since the 1990s. But you, Jan Lekin, you show much more skepticism on ChatGPT. You say there is nothing revolutionary in this. It's just well stitched and nicely done. Yes, it's a good product, which has the advantage of having been put in the hands of users and the public. So it's good engineering. It's very, very well stitched indeed, but it's not revolutionary. At the level of science and the underlying technology, it's not revolutionary at all, no. Well, it's easy for people like me and my colleagues who see it as trenches. For us, it's a natural evolution. There are indeed capacities that we see emerging in these systems that are extremely surprising, but which have not been revealed to us by ChatGPT, which dates back several years. So what we find is that we can train these deep learning systems, which are what we call artificial neural networks of very, very large size, which have billions and billions of what we call parameters. These are the equivalent of the effectiveness of connections between neurons in the brain. If you will, if we try to make an analogy that is not entirely correct, we can train them on absolutely enormous quantities of text of the order of 1,000 billion words. So the totality of texts that reside on the Internet, and they certainly end up learning to use the language, but also to do a certain level of reasoning and in any case to adapt the things they have read to the situation where they are asked. But the principle on which they are based is purely and simply to try to predict the continuation of a text. That is, if you ask them a question, they try to predict the words that would be the most likely in the corpus of texts on which they have been trained. And of course, in the text they have been trained, there is a lot of human knowledge, but which is very superficial. That is to say that it is human knowledge that is present in the texts on the Internet, but it does not understand, for example, the knowledge of the physical world, of the real world. So these systems, in a way, have much less knowledge of the real world than your cat. The development of ChatGPT still worries. Italy has become, on Friday, the first country to temporarily block ChatGPT. And then there was this open letter, 15 days ago, from a thousand experts in the sector, including Elon Musk, who called to suspend for six months the research on the new, more powerful systems, assuming that they were dangerous for humanity. You reacted by comparing the signatories of this letter to the Catholic Church, which in the 15th century demanded a moratorium on the use of printing. Why, why do you find this open letter, signed in particular by Elon Musk, Ridiculous or stupid?
Well, two things. First of all, Italy has banned the use of chat GPT, not at all for the consequences of AI systems, but rather for reasons of protection of private debt. That is to say that people interact with these systems, sometimes give them very personal information. And behind that, the company that produces the system ruses this data to adjust the system so that the next time we use it, the answers are a little more correct and appropriate. So it's more reasons for private data protection that concern them more than anything else. Now for the letter. Indeed, every time a new technology, particularly a communication technology, has appeared, there has always been a reaction trying to imagine dangers that were sometimes real, sometimes not so real as that. And the question is, what is the compromise between risks and advantages? In so, for printing in particular, the Catholic Church did not like at all the idea that people could read the Bible themselves and no longer have to speak to priests. And in fact, they said it would destroy society. And in fact, they were absolutely right. It destroyed Christianity in Europe in a way by creating the Protestant movements and so on. On the other hand, it also allowed the Age of Enlightenment, rationalism, science, philosophy, and democracy. So the invention of printing actually contributed to a new renaissance, a new phase in human development. We can contrast this with other regions, such as the Ottoman Empire at the same time, which actually banned the use of printing. And this contributed to their decline while they were dominant during the Middle Ages in terms of science and technology. So we have to be wary, in fact, when new communication technologies appear, that they make people smarter, either directly or by multiplying their intelligence or their knowledge. We take a huge risk by limiting the use of these technologies. The question is, do we have to regulate it? Because the European Union, and in particular the European Parliament, is about to regulate artificial intelligence. How do you look at this future law that will come? Do you think it's going in the right direction? Or do you say, be careful, it may limit investments in Europe? What is your view on this? There is no doubt that applications and uses need to be regulated. The deployment of artificial intelligence. So, for example, if we use an artificial intelligence system as a medical diagnostic tool or a security system or an automatic driver in cars, it is obvious that they must be tested very well before putting them on the market because they risk putting lives in danger. So we absolutely need to regulate applications. Now do we also need to limit research and development? And this is where I am in great disagreement with the signatories of this letter, of this moratorium of six months. First of all, I think it's a very, very bad idea. It's a kind of new obscurantism. If we replace ourselves at the time of the invention of the printing house, I don't see a good motivation at all to try to limit progress, scientific progress. In fact, we must rather accelerate scientific research if we want to be able to build AI systems that are beneficial for humanity in general. Mm. So that's the first point. And the second point is obviously completely unrealistic to tell people to stop research for six months. First of all, it will be useless, and then anyway, no one will do it. It's been 30 years, Jan Lekin, that you have been living in the United States. Why did not you make a career in France? Because researchers are not well paid enough in France. Yes, that's part of it, but not only that. No, there are two things that attract researchers. In addition, the situation is very different now from what it was 30 or 35 years ago. At the time, in any case, when I left, industrial research in France was relatively applied and in the short term. So it was actually quite difficult to work in the field of science, information, computer science, and so on. In an industrial laboratory that had ambitions of fairly open research, let's say, in the long term, it was not in the usual. There was this kind of opportunity in the United States. I worked at Bell Laboratories, Bell Laboratories, which belonged to the at and company, the big telephone company at the time. Their lab was mythical in terms of impact on modern society. 
In fact, a large part of the technologies that are used today were invented at Bell Labs between the 40s and modern times. In the 80s and 90s, including deep learning methods, which I mentioned earlier, which I started working on in the 90s and 90s. Otherwise, there is actually academic research in universities or public laboratories. The situation has not changed much in France, in the sense that public researchers are not well paid in France certainly much better in the United States and in Switzerland in Europe. It's a bit of a general problem in Europe, not just in Switzerland. Yes, and that's something you regret. France produces many talents. You are one of them. It can't keep them. So, in fact, what changes the situation a little bit at the moment is that the big American tech companies have laboratories established in France or in Europe. So I created one called Fair Paris, which is a branch of the AI Research Laboratory in Meeting, which is in Paris, which has about 100 people, and which is really at the top, in which we also train doctoral students. There are about 30 of them at the moment. So a dozen doctoral students a year leave these labs and actually sow knowledge in the French ecosystem. Because all these PhDs are done in collaboration with universities or public laboratories, so a great collaboration with the French ecosystem, which has actually contributed to popularizing the field and attracting young talents in the field of research in AI, who would have done finance or something like that before. There is the case. Yes, go ahead. To give you an example, there is an open source system that my colleagues have just distributed called Llama with tools, and which is a kind of VBT chat, or in any case, a version of VBT chat, but which is open source, so which is usable by all researchers. You can try to see how it works. Of the 14 authors of this system, 11 are in Paris. What is the discovery that you are most proud of in one word, very quickly? Oh, well, it's certainly easy to say. These convolutive networks are used to allow machines to see, to interpret images, videos, and so on. So it's an invention that dates back to the late 80s. That's your discovery. That's it. My name is attached to this discovery, of course, with collaborators, and which has completely revolutionized the AI in the last 10 years, and which actually contributed to the rise of the AI that we are observing today. I wanted to ask you, smiling earlier, but I ask you again the question, will one day my virtual assistant ask you questions? And will your virtual assistant answer me? Will it be that in five years or in a hundred years? No, I think this kind of interview is always done in person. No, on the other hand, there is a future in 10, 15 years, perhaps, or maybe a little longer, in which we will no longer walk around with smartphones in our pockets. We will have augmented reality reality glasses, which will be able to superimpose virtual images on the real world, which will be able to display information, and so on, and which will allow us to do things that we could do today. In fact, for which technology exists, which would be, for example, simultaneous translation. So we could talk to someone who speaks another language and the subtitles will automatically appear in our glasses, and we will all walk around with virtual glasses in the street. Let's say things a little bit like that, maybe not. Maybe some would always prefer to have a smartphone with a separate screen. Both things are possible. But what is also possible is that we will interact with these new systems through the voice, through new interfaces. For example, what we call interfaces by electromugram, so bracelets that we can wear around the arm, which measure the electrical currents of the nerves, and which allow us, for example, to interact with, to point or type on the keyboard with our hands in our pockets. So several interaction systems, but above all, interact with intelligent virtual assistants who will at some point have intelligence similar to human intelligence, perhaps superior in some areas, and who will be able to help us in our daily lives. It would be like having a best friend 
perhaps more intelligent than you, but at your service, all the time present, who helps you in your everyday life, and who, for example, allows you to focus on the things that interest you and not having to spend an hour on the phone to talk to your plumber or to your administration of the social situation. Listen, I don't know if it's a perspective that will delight our listeners or that will worry them deeply. But in any case, you promise us that in the world in 15 years, so it's tomorrow. Thank you, in any case, Yan Legan, for being with us today. When the machine learns the revolution of artificial neurons and deep learning, this is your book, by Odell Jacob. It will be out soon. By the way, thank you for being with us on this special day. Artificial intelligence on inter. Thank you. Thank you very much.